This is CBC Here and Now. Each of the regional health authorities has been affected, but to a different extent. Cyber attacks are increasingly more common. Healthcare has been attacked in the US for the last two years constantly. Um, last year, the Irish healthcare system was uh, totally paralyzed. Information technology breach, a cyber attack in this province. The healthcare system left scrambling, disrupting thousands of appointments, procedures, and tests. Well, as we turn the page to November, looks like a little bit more snow in the forecast. The world can't stop, and, and you can't stop doing the things you love, you know? I do not want to spend another winter here in Newfoundland if I can help it. Florida bound, this snowbird is ready to hit the road. This time next week, he'll be crossing the border and there are many more like him. Dissolving the English school district. One recommendation of the Green Report is closer to happening. A commitment needs to be there and, and what we've heard in the past is that, that that commitment is going to result in increased resourcing put back into the system. Coming up on Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. Let's get to our top story. We begin tonight with an apparent cyber attack on the province's health care system that's forcing thousands of medical procedures and appointments to be cancelled. Here and Now's Mark, uh, Peter Cowan has been looking into this story tonight and joins us now live. So, Peter, what do we know about the cause of this situation? Yeah, Carolyn, it was about midday Saturday that servers running key systems in Eastern Health went down. And let's look at some of the main things that are offline. The computer systems to register patients, retrieve patient data, it's not working. The system that stores and retrieves medical imaging in, and all sorts of diagnostic tests, it's down as well. Even regular old email isn't working for any of the health authorities. So what's behind this? Well, sources inside the health system have been told it's ransomware, where computer systems are locked out by hackers, and in return, they demand money in order to unlock the systems. The minister didn't rule that out today, but instead he said that even on the third day of this outage, they still don't know what's happening. At the moment, all we uh, know for certain is that this is a possible cyber attack uh, and the nature and extent of it are still uh, under investigation. Uh, it will take a day or two uh, for that investigation to be completed and I have as yet not received any further information beyond what I've just provided to you. Well, so let's talk about the impact. The biggest impact is on Eastern. Uh, there are some issues with Central, and it's less of an impact on Western and Labrador Grenfell Health. For Eastern Health, today and tomorrow, and possibly even Wednesday, it's emergency procedures or imaging only. Other procedures are going to be cancelled and rescheduled, and they can't even call you to reschedule because that information is stuck inside the computer systems they can't access. Flu shots and COVID vaccines are going ahead, but even chemotherapy today was cancelled. Everything is operating at a lot slower pace because the backup plan is paper. We have contingency plans, which means we go back to a paper-based uh, system, which is not very efficient and slow and means, of course, that we've made the decision to do only emergency procedures. So there would be uh, lots of uh, people today uh, within our organization who are working in a less than ideal manner, but they are doing everything they can within a paper-based system to keep people safe. So some key things that are continuing, uh, if you need to get a COVID test, the online system isn't working, instead call 811. The big question is, how long is this going to go on? The minister said today that he's being told optimistic prediction would be it'll take a couple of days to get back up and running, but they don't know for sure. An interesting comparison, the Irish health system faced a ransomware attack earlier this year, and even though the hackers decrypted the data after a week without even getting paid, months later they were still facing service disruptions. Anthony? All right, Peter, thank you. That's Peter Cowan reporting live from our newsroom. Now, as the Department of Health wrestles with this computer meltdown, pati patients across the province, well, they're the ones who are paying the price in this. Most non-emergency procedures were canceled today in eastern and central health uh, regions. Here and now is Garrett Barry is standing by in our uh, Gander newsroom live. So, Garrett, what have you been hearing? Well, Anthony, one of the challenges today is we don't know for sure how many appointments have been cancelled. Even the health officials themselves don't know. That's because that information is on computers that they don't have access to. 
We do know that these appointments include surgeries, MRIs, x-rays, even chemotherapy, and the cancellations are having big impacts on the families involved. Just consider the cost of getting in and out of town for a surgery that didn't even happen. That's Paul Vincent's story, who was traveling for a biopsy on a newly discovered growth. He's gotten no answers this morning, so he already made the trip back to New West Valley. I'm a retiree. It's really no inconvenience for me. A little bit of time, a big deal, right? But when you're on a fixed budget and you've got $400 gone out of your wallet that you can't get back, yeah, that's uh, that that's that's a little bit of an inc <laughs> more than an inconvenience, right? Now it's common for patients here in central Newfoundland to travel to St. John's for procedures, but some do travel much further. Consider an 800-kilometer trip from Happy Valley Goose Bay to St. John's. Here's Jessica Connors. I had to have a tumor taken out, and now with that, it was a grade two tumor, meaning that I had a chance of growing back. So for the foreseeable future, for the next three to five years, I have to get MRI scans every six months to ensure that there's no regrowth coming back. For me, like, it's not only the task of getting here from Labrador, but mentally for me preparing myself for this appointment and results, etc. I have myself to work up to get this done and over with. Since CBC first spoke with Connors, she has been rescheduled for tomorrow morning, but others are still waiting for answers. For one family in St. John's, this morning's cancelled surgery is leading to a lot of questions. He's in limbo because he's on workers' comp as of now, but if the surgery's not going to be for another week, does he go back to work and then go back on workers' comp? You know, that kind of thing, because he's limited hours. Like, he, he's limited hours, but once the surgery happened, he's not allowed to work for, it could be four to six weeks or eight weeks. Eastern Health CEO David Diamond says the health authority is trying to prioritize out-of-town patients and get them seen before they return home. Though he does expect to see similar cancellations tomorrow and other health authorities are expected to see service impacts as well. So if you are one of those patients who travels a long way for health care in this province, your best bet is to check, check the health authority websites tonight or tomorrow before you get on the road. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Garrett Berry in Gander. Now, as Garrett Barry and Peter Cowan just reported, there is still a lot we don't know about this attack. One cybersecurity analyst I spoke with says there may be a reason for that. I think it's still very early to know. I, I understand that uh, sometimes information is hard to get out, and often these organizations don't want to give out too much because they're, if they are dealing with a ransomware, well, they don't want to show their hand in case they, they have to go through negotiations. Now, Harper says for most organizations, it's not a matter of if you'll be the victim of a cyber attack, but when. More of my conversation with Sam Harper. That's ahead in about 30 minutes on Here and Now. Well, the province's self-assessment and testing referral app is also down. Anyone who requires a COVID-19 test is being advised to call 811. Now, the province announced two new COVID-19 cases today. One is a person under 20 in the Eastern Health Region, a contact of a previous case. The other is a man in Western. That case is tied to travel. That makes 91 active cases in the province. There's also an exposure warning today. Anyone who went to the Irving Big Stop restaurant in Deer Lake on Thursday between 1 and 2 p.m. should be tested. There's also a flight advisory for passengers who flew, flew Air Canada 7542 from Toronto to Deer Lake on Thursday. Those passengers should also get tested. Well, there, for those of you that are across the big land and you thought it was a warm October, you were absolutely right. Uh, temperatures through uh, the month of October actually were about 3.3 degrees on average warmer in Wabush. That actually broke a record. And then same thing for Nain, about 2.5 degrees. Uh, no surprise, though, that St. John's actually was uh, a little bit below what you would normally see this time of year, about uh, minus 0 0.3. So we are continuing along with that uh, warm 
for sure as we get into uh, November. Lab City, eight degrees today. You should normally be sitting in and around minus one. Those double digit temperatures as well as you head towards the Happy Valley Goose Bay and Makovic and then right across the board as well uh, for the island temperatures into the double digits for sure. And the reason for that is an area of low pressure and all that warm front, that warm air moving in. That's going to continue. I'll get into those details when I come back. Well, thanks, Ashley. Well, one week from today, Canadian drivers will be able to cross the U.S. border. And as the days grow colder, as Ashley said right off the top, maybe snow in November. Well, one snowbird is already packing up his motorhome because he wants to be first in line. Here now is Colleen Connors met up with him before he goes. When Fred Welsh had to leave Florida in March 2020 because of the pandemic, this is what he came home to. Hours and hours to dig out. Welsh hates the cold. He hasn't spent a winter home in eight years. But unfortunately, I didn't uh, own any winter clothing or uh, snow boots or uh, didn't even own a snow shovel nor a snow blower. So I had to go and purchase all these items uh, to get myself through the winter last year. Now he's fully vaccinated and hopes to be the first in line to cross the U.S. land border when it opens in a week. I am ecstatic. I'm over the moon and back again. Welsh and a group of seven friends are gearing up their RVs now, crossing the U.S. border in St. Stephen, New Brunswick, to make their way here, sunny Florida, where he'll be until May, at least, even though COVID-19 infections are still high in the U.S. If you uh, practice the, uh, the, what you've been taught, you know, of uh, washing your hands and keeping your uh, facial coverings on, I, I don't anticipate any problem. The Canadian Snowbird Association estimates about 30% of Canadian snowbirds headed south last winter, and the number is expected to triple. So we are estimating that approximately 90% of Canadian snowbirds are going to be making the trip this year. We have over a million snowbirds in Canada, so we're looking at about 900,000 Canadians that are going to be making the trip down south this year. Welsh and his crew even plan to get their COVID-19 booster while in the U.S. They are offering boosters to all seniors now. But if I'm down there and, and I can get it, you know, uh, the sooner the better. That's the way I look at it. While coming back is the last thing on Welsh's mind, he does hope the Canadian government does away with the costly PCR test requirements to re-enter the country. He says he'll worry about that in the spring. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Cornerbrook. Well, staying with travel, the Premier is in Scotland taking in the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference. Fury tweeted these pictures today saying Newfoundland and Labrador is well positioned to continue the transition to cleaner energy with its renewable resources. In another tweet, Fury says his government is focused on supporting the offshore industry during that transition as well as on innovation and electrification. Photos also show Fury meeting with the Prime Minister. Well, staying in Glasgow, Justin Trudeau stepped in front of other delegates today to talk about Canada's climate plan. The Prime Minister highlighted his government's existing strategy of putting a price on pollution and announced that Canada will also take a major step to reduce emissions. We'll cap oil and gas sector emissions today and ensure they decrease tomorrow at a pace and scale needed to reach net zero by 2050. That's no small task for a major oil and gas producing country. Trudeau called it a necessary step to do Canada's part to cut global pollution. In 2019, the oil and gas industry alone accounted for 191 megatons of greenhouse gas emissions. And that was 26% of the country's total amount released into the atmosphere. Canada has also committed $1 billion to help de developing countries shift from coal to clean energy. Well, a number of factors contribute to the soaring cost of food and other products, the supply chain, global production issues, as well as overall demand. Well, restaurant owners are starting to feel the squeeze. Here now is Terry Roberts has more. This is the canola oil we use to fry our fish and our drives in. And last year I was paying $22 for a jug of this, and now I'm paying in excess of $44 a jug. Here at the Wild Horses Pub and Eatery in Portugal Cove, the owner says the cost of doing business is getting out of hand. Food is astronomical now. It's so bad that scenes like this may soon be a thing of the past. Wild horses could be put out to pasture 
permanently. I'm to the point now, I have to make enough to pay the salary and pay overhead each week. And if I can't do it, then it's over. From propane to cooking oil, potatoes and disposable gloves, unprecedented high prices, forcing restaurant owners to walk a fine line, absorb the extra cost, or jack up menu prices. How high can you go with some, something as small as fish and chips to pass all that on to the customer? I think, you know, you might gain on one order, but you lose six. Challenge beyond anybody's imagination. Here at Brown's Restaurant in Whiteway, off-season means there's more of this, family time. But the conversation is about how to deal with a staffing shortage or how a doubling of the price of bacon should be reflected in the menu. We've absorbed most of it, and but I don't know how long we can do that. And if I put my prices up too much, it's going to be out of reach for a lot of people. So I don't know where we go from here. After 30 years in operation, Brown's Restaurant is on solid financial footing. However, the owner says it's never been so challenging. But Barb Brown hasn't lost hope. I'm very optimistic that uh, going forward will be challenging, but as rewarding as it's been for 30 years. So, For takeout containers, I find it's three times like the price before I started the store. Spice X is a takeout restaurant in St. John's, specializing in Indian cuisine. Opened just before the pandemic upended life in the province nearly two years ago. But rising costs have turned this owner's business plan upside down. Takeout food containers that used to cost 20 bucks, now $60 per case. And usually ample supplies of onions, chicken breasts have tightened up. As a business owner, I would say it's uh, definitely, uh, it's a bit stressful. You don't know what's uh, going to happen in the future. Midden Matthew opened SpiceX with a plan to offer Indian food at affordable prices, primarily to cost-conscious university students. So for now, he's putting customers and their wallets ahead of his own profits, with no immediate plans to increase menu prices. I find my customers are happy uh, with the, the products and services. I mean, I mean, for now, I have to look that. I, I give priority to that. The restaurant owners I spoke with are hopeful this spike in costs, like the pandemic itself, will soon come to an end. Until that happens, this pressure of staying in business will continue to distract them from their number one priority, which is providing top quality food and customer service. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the province is moving ahead with one of the recommendations from the Premier's economic recovery team. According to the group's final report, dissolving the English school district into the education department could save as much as $12 million annually. Well, the education minister announced the steps being taken to follow that recommendation today. Here in as Mark Quinn reports. The English school district employs about 400 administrators and support staff. The Education Minister expects merging the district with the province's Department of Education will save money, but today promised those savings won't come from massive layoffs. Just how much the move will save isn't clear. I can say it will be in the millions, uh, but we'll be able to put a more finite number once the transition team really start to, to dig deep uh, in terms of transitioning uh, the district into the department. As the CEO of the English School District, Tony Stack will see his current job disappear. But he is part of a transition board that's making the move. Stack says this change can't simply be about saving money. It's very important as we've gone through past permutations and restructuring of various educational aspects that that, uh, that lens is put on this. Uh, ultimately, whatever we do here has to impact the school in a positive way. The Teachers Association was consulted by the province this morning. Its president is keeping an eye on what this change will mean to teachers and students. Number one, whenever there's any change like this coming under pipes, we want to make sure that uh, workload is not expanded for teachers in the province. Uh, it's, it's already heightened as it is. And, and number two, there, there certainly cannot be a reduction in services made available to teachers, students and their families moving forward. The Green Report also recommended dissolving the Francophone School District as well. But that could have led to a constitutional challenge. And Minister Tom Osborne says dissolving the school district that represents a few hundred students wouldn't have resulted in substantial savings. Mark Quinn, CBC News.
St. John's. Well, Anthony, another Tele 10 yeah. road race is in the books, the first since the pandemic. Yeah, Mark Quinn, by the way, you just saw, he ran his 15th yesterday. Wow. Oh, sunny. Like, congratulations. Yeah, COVID canceled the 10 mile road race last year and delayed the 93rd running of that event until yesterday. The race usually takes place in July. Yeah, here now is Henrika Wilhelm hung around the finish line. It's good to be back. Everybody is so glad that they'll be able to get back out and do this run again. You can see. Uh, a lot of the changes here this morning, actually, I mean, all our volunteers are wearing masks. Everybody has to be, uh, the QR code has to be presented, IDs have to be presented. And of course, we're going to have our runners wearing masks in the corrals and probably up to the first seven or 800 meters before they take their mask off. During the first quarantine, I started running a lot and, you know, I, the Tele 10 was cancelled that first year, it was the virtual one, but this time we're back in full force and I'm going to show this world that I can run pretty fast. The excitement on the start line and the finish line when you're running the race is really something special. How was it uh, running this now compared to July? Oh, not a fly in sight. No mosquitoes. It's <laughs> fabulous, right? Uh, no humidity. Wonderful. Great day. So nice to be back in person to see this event. It's absolutely spectacular. And hats off. Congratulations to all the organizers and volunteers. You did a great job. It was excellent. It was so much fun. And uh, it was the first time I ever ran it, but I'm definitely going to run it again. I'm from Plymouth, Massachusetts, and this is my first telly. I actually scheduled my trip to Newfoundland around this race and uh, I started running. It was a great course and come to find out I came in second in my age group, which is a big surprise and a great thrill. So I'm having the best kind of day. First they were playing in St. John's, then in Toronto, and now the Newfoundland Growlers will be playing their season opener right here in Conception Bay South. Coming up, I'll be speaking with CBS Mayor Darren Bent about what this means for the town and for the teams that use the rink. Well, it's been a little bit of a gray, wet day for most of uh, eastern areas of the island. It does look like things will clear up tomorrow. I'll have the full details coming up.
His garage is his second home. John Peril is 65 years a mechanic. Our season debut, Sunday at 11.30 and Monday at 7. Well, a real uh, gray old foggy day here in St. John's today. Uh, how are things looking coming down the pipe? Well, uh after a pretty decent weekend. It was really nice. It was pretty nice, yeah. yeah. I mean, eastern areas of the island saw the fog monster mm -hmm. uh, yesterday. However, uh, some beautiful temperatures as well, and they kind of continued today for parts of the province. Let's take a look at uh, those temperatures right now into the teens. Now, they were a bit warmer than this yesterday, certainly up across Labrador. Uh, in fact, Happy Valley Goose Bay saw its warmest temperature uh, for Halloween on record uh, at trick-or-treating time around six o'clock it was still 11 degrees so absolutely beautiful temperatures not really much different today a couple of degrees cooler uh, nine right now in happy valley goose bay uh, but those temperatures across most of the island are still sitting in the double digits with the exception of some uh, areas along the coast bonavista and uh, cape race right now in those single digits so uh, taking a look at the satellite radar you can see some of that cloud cover this all actually extends all the way down through uh, the southern areas of uh, the Atlantic Atlantic, but we're seeing some showers roll through right now. A couple of hours, those so should move offshore, uh, but we're still going to see that chance of some showers as we head through the evening hours tonight uh, for pretty much most of the island and then up across Labrador as well. Uh, right now, looking at some showers, but that will eventually, as we see some wraparound colder air, uh, change through to some flurries, or at least the risk of some flurries tonight for Lab West. The rest of Labrador should see showers tonight and even some clearing skies uh, for parts of the island as well as we get into the early morning morning hours uh, for most likely going to stay on the cloudy side for eastern areas of the island. So temperatures tonight not really going to move too much, uh, especially in the east, uh, sitting around nine degrees for St. John's. Those winds will be out of the south about 20 to 40 kilometers per hour and then single digit temperatures pretty much across the board uh, again with that chance of showers. But you should see some partly cloudy skies overnight up across Labrador. Your temperatures dipping, especially in Lab West down to minus one. Those winds are also going to ramp up southwesterlies about 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. They're even going to get stronger as we head through the day tomorrow. And then we've got those showers uh, for the rest of the big land. Your temperatures will be hovering around five degrees. So taking a look at uh, the future tracker for tomorrow, uh, area of low pressure to the north and an area of high pressure to the south is going to battle it out and uh, going to see some strong winds develop across Labrador uh, as we head through the afternoon hours tomorrow. Uh, you will likely see those winds picking up, uh, gusting somewhere between 70, maybe even 80 kilometers per hour for most. But it should be a quiet weather day for the majority of the island. You're looking at a mix of sun and cloud by the time the afternoon rolls around, maybe a few lingering showers in the morning, and then we should actually see some clearing. Uh, this, the clouds will be on the increase, though, for the west coast as you get into the evening and uh, overnight hours, and then you'll see that chance of showers move right along with it. Clearing skies, the story for Labrador, but in behind that again, Lab West, unfortunately, you're going to hang on to uh, the cloud cover as well as the potential for some showers through the day and there's those showers as they work their way uh, further north uh, as we get into Wednesday morning. Temperatures tomorrow should stay in the double digits for most of eastern Newfoundland. 13 degrees for St. John's. Winds not too bad, about 15 to 20 kilometers per hour out of the west. And then again, those clearing skies, the story through the day. Uh, same thing as you head towards central, a little bit cooler. Grand Falls winds are about 9 degrees tomorrow. And then uh, similar temperatures for the west coast. There, your winds will be a little bit stronger, though. Uh, still out of the west, but about 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. The chance of showers in the morning. Uh, and then again, in the evening hours and overnight hours. And now for the northern peninsula, you're looking at your temperatures into the single digits. Similar forecast for the coast of Labrador. However, your winds will be stronger, so they will be gusting upwards of about 80 kilometers per hour at times. And then showers for Nain, at least in the morning, and then again in the evening hours. Stronger winds as well for you. 
and then uh, Lab City, you're going to hover around two degrees. So we're getting closer to uh, those cooler temperatures for sure. It looks like that pattern is going to stick around as well. So this is the pattern over the next couple of, or at least over the next week, we see this dig, uh, this as this trough digs, that's going to bring in some cooler air, likely reaching the west coast as we get towards the weekend as well. And that means that we can see that potential uh, for some uh, snow in the forecast, but I'll get into those details when I come back. Well, suspensions, lawsuits, not a great start to this hockey season. And now another twist in the Growler saga. The team will be playing its season opener game right here in CBS. Last week, the city of St. John suspended the hockey team from playing at the Mary Brown Center, pending an investigation into, quote, disrespectful workplace conduct by team ownership. The Growlers received an invite from the Toronto Maple Leafs to play at the Coca-Cola Coliseum, but then another option surfaced. They were offered ice time in CBS. And joining me now is CBS Mayor Darren Bent. So, Mayor Bent, can you tell us about this arrangement? How did this come about? Well, so last Wednesday, when things started to take shape uh, at mile one uh, with the Growlers, uh, we reached out to the Growlers just to see what was going on and, and what was happening with them. Uh, and we did so because a number of our residents had uh, talked to us over the past week or two saying, it'd be great to have the Growlers out here. So we thought, well, if it comes about, we'll, we'll give it a try. So we contacted them. Uh, they said, well, we're going to Ontario for our first six games. And we said, okay. Uh, then Friday afternoon, uh, late Friday afternoon actually, we got a call from the Growlers saying uh, they rethought that and they wanted to stay local and wondering what Conception Bay South, uh, if we had any options. And so we went into the mode of finding out whether we did have those options. We talked to our staff, uh, we contacted our user groups that would be affected. And at the end of the day, by the evening on Saturday, uh, we went back to them and said, yeah, we can host your first six games of the season and we'd be happy to have you here. How did that work logistically did you have to bump a bunch of groups in order to get the growlers in yeah. so what we did was we went to our user groups to ask them if they wouldn't mind stepping aside for the times that we needed uh, to accommodate the growlers for their practices and for their games uh, our user groups uh, uh, were willing to do that uh, but we needed to make some arrangements with them and we spoke to the growlers about that we've got a, some user groups here our cbs skating club our senior blues our junior renegades our minor hockey uh, they're all giving up time so that we can help you and we asked them to help as well so they have agreed to help uh, uh, with our user groups and uh, make them uh, feel like this is a good thing for them as well uh, you know there are always some hurdles with this sort of thing but you know uh, we working with our user groups uh, uh, closely we're at meetings today and so forth to try to find them the extra space or to make some sort of arrangements that will make them feel good about doing this. Did you get any pushback or was everyone pretty much on board? Well, originally uh, we had we had been told that uh, uh, everybody was on board, but you know, once you get thinking about it, there are some issues that always come up. It's like the Growlers, they were going to Ontario and then all of a sudden they realized there were some issues with that. So now they're rethinking it. But you know, we're uh, meetings even today with our user groups to make sure that we iron all this out and that we're all on the same page because you know, they're important to us. Uh, they're our long-term tenants. Uh, you know, this is a short-term contract. And what was the reaction from the city of St. John's on this? We're very, uh, um, I, I guess, uh, appreciative of our relationship with all of our neighbors here on the Northeast Avalon and the city of St. John's as well. Uh, I reached out to my counterpart, you know, to uh, on Friday to see what uh, they were saying. And they were very happy uh, that we were able to help keep the growlers in the region to keep the fan base with the team rather than have them go to a place where the fans wouldn't get to see them, you know? It also, look, it keeps, it, when you get people out of their homes and into their vehicles moving around, you're gonna spend some money. There's gonna be some economic spin-offs. And we expect that to be true for St. John's as well as CBS through this time. That wouldn't have happened if everybody had gone to Ontario. But there is such a tense relationship, it seems right now, between the Growlers and the city of St. John's and an ongoing investigation. Are, are you concerned about kind of getting in the middle of that? No, not at all. That's why we reached out to St. John's and we spoke to the Growlers specifically on that, that that's between them. Uh, we're just providing a facility in the meantime, keeping them in the region, keeping them close to their fan base and allowing for the financial revenues to uh, be maintained in the Northeast Avalon. So no hard feelings from Mayor Danny Breen? Not at all. Matter of fact, he thought it was a great idea. Mayor Darren Bent, thank you so much. Thank you, Carolyn.
Well, if you're wondering about tickets, the Growlers says it's working with the town of CBS to make tickets available in the coming days and priority will be given to season ticket holders. Those who already purchased tickets through mile one should receive an automatic refund from the box office. Those mile one tickets are not transferable. Healthcare hacks. We're going to go right to our top story. Surgical cancellations, patients blocked from being admitted, entire email system down, back to pens and paper instead of computers. The healthcare minister says the system is damaged, but we don't know the extent of that damage and we don't know who has your healthcare data. Sam Harper is a journalist who specializes in cybersecurity, also happens to be a former doctor, and he joins us now from Quebec. Mr. Harper, what's your overall assessment of what appears to be happening here? Well, as uh, as uh, the, the minister said, it looks like there's uh, the, the system's under attack by uh, cyber attack. Um, one hypothesis is that it could be a ransomware, but we don't have confirmation from that yet. What seems to be the case is that the most systems are down, so uh, email systems, things like that. Um, yeah, I think it's still very early to know. I, I understand that uh, sometimes information is hard to get out, and often 
these organizations don't want to give out too much because they're if they are dealing with a ransomware, well, they don't want to show their hand in case they, they have to go through negotiations. Right. Well, let's let's just be clear then. Well, what is ransomware, as you put it? Basically, it's just uh, an attack where the attacker will ask for ransom in exchange to give you back access to your data. So they'll come in, infect your systems with something that will um, encrypt your data and make it unaccessible to you. Now, from from when you've looked at this in, in other jurisdictions, do do governments ever pay the ransom? Um, <laughs> usually people who pay the ransom don't talk about it. So it's very hard to tell. We, we have more information on those that don't, uh, because often then groups will try to shame them by publishing the, the data on the dark web or on, on their websites. Um, so we don't have very much information on who pays and how much they pay, though. And I guess there's always a risk, right? You could pay the ransom and never get anything back. Yeah, that is that is a risk. Right. Now, the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity just last year warned healthcare systems to take a really good look at how they protect their IT systems. And a lot of people here, Mr. Harper, today wondering just how is something like this actually possible? Unfortunately, for a lot of organizations, it's not so much a question of like if they're going to get attacked, it's more when they're going to get attacked. So, I mean, it's kind of a, a wake up call, I think, to everybody that you need to be prepared and have a, a plan in place for when this does happen. Um, healthcare has been attacked in the US for the last two years constantly. Um, last year, the Irish healthcare system was uh, totally paralyzed um, following a ransomware attack. So, and, and that's not even counting like the private sector and small and, and uh, medium companies too. So, so these kinds of attacks can cripple a system and we might not actually know how long this is going to last. I mean, even in a best case scenario where the, the province has all the backups, they still have to like manually go through all these backups to make sure that they're not infected. Because if you like put your system back up with uh, an old uh, a backup where the attacker's already in place and already has a back door to be able to get back in, well, then you're kind of just facing the same problem again. So even in the best case scenario, it takes time. Uh, they also have to make sure that no data has been stolen. Um, and that also takes a certain amount of time. But shouldn't something trigger an alarm that sort of has a system that kicks in place to, to repel this? Because we heard the health minister today say that the brain was attacked, but the duration, yes. the duration of the outage and what's going on, I mean, it seems to suggest that this is fairly serious. Yes, <laughs> that, that would, that's to say the least. Um, I'm, it's not exactly sure what they mean by the brain. Um, if it's something like in a lot of like Windows systems, there's what we call Active Directory, which is basically the that kind of lets you know who the users are, who can access what. Uh, so if I send a, an email to somebody in the healthcare system, it knows like to who to, to forward it to, who can access uh, lab files and things like that. Mm -hmm. So if that's down, um, I, then you can understand why like nobody can access anything. Right. Final question for you. So for people watching us having this discussion, how concerned should citizens of Newfoundland and Labrador be about just who has their healthcare information? Honestly, right now, we it's, it's hard to tell. Um, if a group has stolen their data, the, the information will come out pretty soon. I mean, usually after a few days, once if they don't uh, receive payment, these groups, when they do steal the, the data first, they'll usually boast about it and try to, to shame the, the victims into paying. Um, so in the next few days, I guess that's when we'll, we'll know. All right, well, Mr. Harper, I appreciate your insight into this. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Welcome back to Here and Now. A rally in support of Sudan was held in St. John's over the weekend. <laughs> People gathered outside City Hall to show solidarity for the Northeast African country. The military took power in a coup last week. Sudan's prime minister was arrested and is currently under house arrest. His transitional government was dissolved. People in this province are now asking the Canadian government for support. It's sad, you know, to hear that all your uh, family and all the uh, Sudanese as a general are being um, oppressed by a government uh, that is not respecting human rights and uh, killing people, torturing and uh, detain uh, innocent people. Well, we mentioned the United Nations Climate Change Conference earlier in the show. Leaders and delegates from more than 100 countries are in Glasgow for the UN Climate Summit talks. U.S. President Joe Biden is sink seeking to reassure the world about his nation's commitment will demonstrate to the world the United States is not only back at the table, but hopefully leading by the power of our example. And every day we delay, the cost of inaction increases. So let this be the moment that we answer history's call here in Glasgow. His predecessor, Donald Trump, had pulled the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Accord, which Biden reversed after taking office. At the COP26 summit, world leaders are now trying to meet the targets set in 2015 to curb emissions fast enough to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius below pre-industrial levels. Another key goal is to secure the $1 billion per year funding promised by rich nations to help lesser developed nations. Well, COVID struck a very sour note with music during the entire pandemic. It silenced choirs everywhere and masks presented a host of challenges for singers. Well, an Ottawa choir director rose to the challenge and designed a mask that's tailor-made for fellow performers. As Sandra Abma reports, choral groups around the world are adopting the idea. From the basement of her home near Britannia Beach, Joan Fearley started a sewing circle that stretched around the world. The soprano and choir director sat down at her sewing machine when she couldn't find a face mask suitable for singers. They were really close to the lips and you would breathe in and you would suck the fabric right into your mouth. You would open wide to make a tall vowel and the mask would pop off. So for the singer's mask, it's best to use a... Hurley came up with her own pattern for masks, tailor-made for singers. Masks that would allow choirs to safely make music together. Then she shared her designs and instructions on YouTube and Facebook. including demonstrations of how the mask fit and, most importantly, how it sounds. She wasn't interested in starting a business or selling masks. She just wanted people to start sewing. I wanted people to have the tools to help themselves. Thousands of people have seen her videos, creating a network of seamstresses, singers and scientists who pitched in design suggestions, but for the most part, picked up needles and thread to create their own masks for choral and theater groups around the world. Having um, the super mask that Joan has come up with allow for a space in front of the mouth for resonant sound, but also for being able to take a breath in and not breathe in a mouthful of fabric. An innovation that started here that's helped singers raise their voices in song once again. Sandra Abma, CBC News. Ottawa.
A new charity called the Calypso Fund is raising money to help provide veterinary care to surrendered and abandoned animals at the SPCAs in our province. Yes, its uh, first fundraising event was a Halloween-themed photo shoot for people and their pets at Bowering Park in St. John's this weekend. Just have a look. Animals that have been surrendered or abandoned, they may have a broken leg or they may be injured in another way or sick and uh, along with that comes um, veterinary care and that can sometimes be difficult for shelters to raise funds to provide. So our goal with the Calypso Fund is to help the SPCAs with that fundraising so that we can do the work that needs to be done so those animals can have a second chance. This is the first event that we've had. We have had a lot of people come out today. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, some people knew ahead of time. We tried to do a little bit of a preamble so people knew that we were coming, um, but other people um, just saw what was happening and decided to come over and find out. We had a lot of dogs, big, small, fluffy, not fluffy. We, we said, you know, if you wanted to sign up, you could do a minimum donation of ten dollars but uh, honestly we took lots of pictures today and i don't you know it's, it's all good <laughs> it was just about people finding out that we're here as a veterinarian we see a lot of difficult things and if we can do something to make it better for everybody which is what this is all about then that's what we want to do so you know it's more than about the animals it's about the people too it's a it's a tough field sometimes there's a lot of wonderful things but it can be really tough and we just we want to help like not just the animals but help the people too so cute i love dogs in halloween costumes i mean who doesn't right yeah no <laughs> And speaking of Halloween costumes, <laughs> on Friday you had your Halloween costume on and we had a little contest about that. Yes, and you guys were really good at guessing uh, what I was. We had lots and lots of comments. Uh, so I picked a few, mm -hmm. uh, and four in fact, today. Uh, and you're going to get a CBC prize pack. So I will be in contact. But the winners uh, from Facebook were Laura Blunden and Mike Kettle. And then on Twitter, uh, Kathy Burton and Paula McDonald. So congratulations and uh, thanks very much for participating. Yeah, and so we have a little CBC prize pack that we're going to send out. Yep, we'll do that this week. Excellent. <laughs> All right, so looking ahead to the long range forecast, how are things looking? Looking very uh, close to what uh, we would expect for winter for sure. We're going to start to see some cooler temperatures move in and also some snow in the forecast for some areas. Let's take a look at the future tracker just to show you what's going to happen. So lots of shower or rather lots of flurry activity expected for western Labrador along a cold front uh, that is going to move through and then that cooler air eventually as we head through the day on Wednesday uh, will pretty much encompass most of the big land. Some showers to start for the island on Wednesday, but as that cooler air moves in, uh, we will see that potential for some flurries. It looks like Thursday night, uh, some of it picking up in the higher elevations uh, on the west coast. So wouldn't be surprised to see some snowfall. Uh, likely not huge amounts, but that uh, chance is certainly still there. And then across Labrador, looking at a very unsettled pattern uh, with that chance of showers and or flurry sticking around for most as we see some of those cooler temperatures back down to uh, where we should be this time of year. It's going to take a little bit to get there, though, because, uh, yes, Lab West will be in and around your normal temperatures, but minus two. Uh, but we're still going to hang on to those milder temperatures the further uh, east you go. Happy Valley Goose Bay, the chance of flurries later on in the day as that temperature drops but hovering around six degrees to start on Wednesday and then uh, Cartwright looking at eight degrees. Going to hang on to the double digit temperatures across most of the island as well, except the west coast. You're going to hang into some of those single digits with that chance of showers and then the single digits will make an appearance as we get into Thursday. So chance of showers and there's that risk of uh, some snow that I put in the forecast there for the west coast corner brook uh, hovering around six degrees and then again that snow staying in there for you for uh, lab west otherwise plenty of sunshine up across the big land except your temperatures will be cooler only hovering around zero or one over the next couple of days those temperatures are going to continue to be fairly cool for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland single digit temperatures looks like Friday's at this point pretty nice but uh, bookended by some showers either Thursday or both Thursday and Saturday. And then as we head towards central Newfoundland, uh, you're looking at uh, a nice start to the weekend, maybe a few showers in play on Saturday. 
and uh, your overnight lows are going to start to dip. So even uh, Western Newfoundland, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, have that potential for some flurries in there for you. For Eastern Labrador, once you get into Saturday, that risk of flurries will uh, move in for you, except for the West. That's your story through the week. Temperatures will be hovering near or a few degrees below zero. Had to share this photo. <laughs> Fall rainbow over Victoria River uh, just outside Millertown. Thank you to Tony for sending that shot. If you have any weather photos, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Right place, right time, Tony. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful <laughs> shot. Yeah, busy show. Thanks a lot for watching. Mm -hmm. Obviously, lots of news to follow, and we'll see you tomorrow. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.